Hello and welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about deuterostomes, but before we talk about deuterostomes, I just want to remind you to keep up with your due dates, make sure you're working on your study guides, make sure you're studying for your tests, and keeping up with all of your work. If you have any questions, please make sure you email me, post it on Blackboard, or get with some other students. So today we will be talking about deuterostomes, and uh, we have two major groups we'll talk about. We'll talk about the uh, echinoderms, and we're going to talk about the chordates. And this will wrap up our discussion of animals. So we'll talk about echinoderms first. Echinoderm literally means spiny skin. So echino means spiny and derm means skin. And they have certain characteristics that they all share in common, and we'll talk about those in one second. There are about 7,000 species of these that have been described so far. Um, they're only found in uh, salt water, so marine only. Uh, so far, we've never discovered any in freshwater. <clears throat> many of them, not all of them, but many of them do have uh, what we call a pentaradial symmetry. And uh, if you've ever seen a starfish, you'll know that it has basically five rays or arms that come off. And we call that penta. Penta is the root for five. And radial it has a radial symmetry. They do have spiny skin, hence the name echinoderm. So if you look over the surface of their skin, there will be little spines. Sometimes they're really long spines, like when you talk about a sea urchin. But uh, spines are something you'll find over the surface of their skin. If you flip them to their bottom surface, they'll actually have these little hundreds of these little tube feet. And uh, I'll show you what those look like in one second. They also have a water vascular system. This is a system where they can pump water into their body to actually make their tube feet uh, work to, for, to help them move around. They do have a nerve ring, and, uh, but they don't have a brain. So they do have a ring of nerves that uh, help them to sense things and coordinate activities, but they don't have a brain. Um, they do regenerate lost parts. If we take our starfish up here and you were to cut it in half, that half would create a new sea star, and that half would create a new sea star. Um, this regeneration of lost parts was not known to early uh, fishermen, but uh, fishermen who fish for clams and oysters and, uh, and uh, shellfish, they do compete with starfish, which also eat those same food sources. And early on, fishermen that caught sea stars would actually take and cut them into pieces and throw them back, thinking they were killing them, but actually they were helping them to reproduce. Uh, and they don't have excretory organs, probably because they live in water. They can just excrete through their skin um, any of their uh, waste products. And this just shows you a picture of a, of a sea star, just showing you some of the common characteristics that they might share in common. Um, they do have a complete digestive tract. So here's the anus, and the mouth would be on the, on the bottom surface. I can't show you that on this particular diagram. But they do have a mouth and then, you know, a, a series of, of tubes that the food goes through. You can see the stomach here. And then waste products come out through the anus. Um, they do have a, a madreporite. This is a, 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 a opening that allows water to come into the sea star. And uh, once it goes through that that, uh, that uh, opening, it goes into the water vascular system that uh, will, uh, will run the uh, tube feet. You can see there's a little ring canal there, and uh, the water vascular system extends down into here, and the tube feet are going to be run off of water pressure. Here's a tube foot you can see, and if water's not in there, these things don't work uh, in the exact way they should. Uh, you can see here digestive glands. And, uh, and uh, they also have uh, gonads, so they can reproduce or make sperm cells and egg cells. Um, each one of these things is called a ray. It's just an arm that extends out. And again, you can see pentadactyl uh, symmetry there, five uh, members or uh, five rays. This just shows a different diagram. Uh, I kind of like this one just because it shows the tube feet a little bit better. So these tube feet run off of water pressure and they're connected together by that water vascular system. Water comes in through the madreporite, and uh, I like this too because you can see little gills here that helps them extract oxygen from the water, and those would be all over the surface of the skin, and they do have spines that are on the surface. Probably makes them less palatable but, uh, to things that uh, eat them. Sometimes the spines in sea urchins or something like that will be really long. Oftentimes they'll be attached to venom glands, so they'll be uh, help the, the sea urchin or 
animal with them be um, venomous. And this is just showing you some of the different members of this group. Here you have a sea star. Probably most of you are familiar with the sea stars. Here we have a brittle star. Note that you still have pentadactyl uh, symmetry. These are sand dollars. They don't necessarily have pentadactyl symmetry to them. But uh, these are relatively common when you go yeah, to like Myrtle Beach. You know, you can find sand dollars there and south of Myrtle Beach. Although I've seen, I found them in the Chesapeake Bay before, but they get to be uncommon as you get uh, further up north. Um, so these are really interesting. This is what it looks like when it's alive. The skin is kind of brownish or greenish. And uh, here's one that's a little bit darker over here. And if you flip them over on their uh, underside, you'll see all the tube feet. Most of the time, if you go to a shell shop, you'll find these things that will be, they'll be bleached white and uh, all the skin's been taken off of them. So these are sea urchins here. Sea urchins can be uh, non-venomous or venomous. Some of the venomous ones are quite venomous. And uh, they're not venomous to, to capture prey, but they're venomous to protect themselves from being stepped on. So uh, if you ever go to uh, places where sea urchins are common, for example, Florida or Hawaii, um, you want to make sure you wear shoes and you're very careful about where you step. So you don't know if you're touching a venomous one or a non-venomous one, so I'd be very educated about that if I go to those areas. I've been both to Hawaii and to Florida and have swam with the sea urchins, and in some areas they're very, very, very common creatures. So you want to be real careful when you're walking through the water in those subtropical or tropical um, areas. This is a sea cucumber. It's kind of an interesting looking organism, but it does have the spiny skin, um, so it is a member of this particular group, the echinoderms. It has the same kind of uh, anatomy as well. I know it doesn't have pentadactyl symmetry, but um, it, uh, it is a, a very interesting creature. They do get uh, kind of large, and uh, I found these float, you know, s uh, washed up on the beach after storms before, and uh, they're, they're very interesting creatures if you ever get an opportunity to uh, touch one. Um, this is a sea lily. It uh, actually looks like a plant, but it uh, it is a um, an echinoderm. It has all the characteristics of echinoderms. These are feather stars. So feather stars again are echinoderms. They have all the same common characteristics as other members of this particular group. And online, I'll put a video of of uh, of a coral that's eating the. Um, the, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 an echinoderm that's eating the coral reef, and uh, it's called the crown of thorns. And that crown of thorns, I don't really want to watch this here, but that crown of thorns is uh, is a major pr uh, uh, problem for um, for the uh, the survival of coral reefs. I want you to take a look at that video and uh, and uh, make make sure that uh, you see what's the cause of it and what uh, we're doing to stop the crown of thorns from eating all of the coral um, reefs. Let's see if I can get out of this video here. <clears throat> okay, and now we'll uh, go ahead and move towards uh, our last group, uh, which is called the phylum chordata. So these are the chordates. General characteristics include bilateral symmetry. They're triploblastic, meaning they have three germ cell layers, that endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. They do have a coelom, a true body cavity, and they have a complete digestive tract, a mouth and an anus. Um, they do have closed circulatory systems, so these are going to utilize blood vessels to carry their blood through, um, th through the circulatory system. Okay, so those are general characteristics. These are very distinctive and specific characteristics for chordates that are going to that you won't find in other organisms. So one of the major characteristics is this notochord. This is a flexible rod of tissue that resides between the digestive tube and the nerve cord. And uh, what in you, what the notochord did for you was it actually directed while you were an embryo, it directed the construction of your uh, of your spinal cord and your brain. So it's very important developmentally for humans to have a notochord, and it serves different functions in different chordates. But in us, it serves the function of helping to direct the construction of our spinal cord and, uh, and brain. Um, another distinctive characteristic of this group is having a dorsal hollow nerve cord. And uh, this is made from ectoderm 
one of those three layers of tissues we talked about earlier. And, uh, and this dorsal hollow, uh, hollow nerve cord uh, will develop into the brain and spinal cord. Um, all of these creatures called chordates have pharyngeal slits. These pharyngeal slits will, uh, are, are openings in the pharynx or throat region. Um, in uh, fish, they become gill supports and help to make gills strong. In tetrapods, organisms with four limbs, um, they become parts of our throat, like tonsils, eustachian tube, which is the tube that drains your, um, your um, middle ear, and uh, the middle ear cavity. Now, some of you may have had tubes in your ears, so I don't know if that's because your pharyngeal slits didn't form correctly. Probably not, but, um, but the eustachian tube is the thing that drains your middle ear. All of these organisms also have a post-anal tail, which is an extension of the body beyond the anus. So you had a post-anal tail too, and uh, it was when you were an embryo, and then it was reabsorbed. Some people are born with little small tails, and uh, they have them surgically removed. Uh, perhaps you were one of those people that had a, um, a post-anal tail. Uh, you can tell if you go and look at yourself in the mirror you'll, where your vertebrae end, you may see a scar there. Maybe your parents didn't tell you that you had one. All right, so these are, these are the characteristics just showing you visually what they look like. And uh, you can see the notochord is this little part or flexible rod of tissue in between your dorsal hollow, hollow nerve cord and, uh, and the digestive tract. And again, that directs in us, it directs the, um, the development of the brain and spinal cord. The dorsal hollow nerve cord in us are, are, is the brain and spinal cord. Uh, post anal tail is behind the anus, so there's a little hole. He well, you can see the anus right here, excuse me. So it's this structure that's beyond the anus, would be the post anal tail. And then pharyngeal slits, remember in fish, they become gill arches, uh, gill supports. And in, uh, in other uh, organisms, tetrapods, they become things like tonsils and. Uh, and uh, parts of the throat and uh, eustachian tubes and middle ear. So this is a phylogeny of, uh, of existing um, chordates. And uh, what you see here is a cladogram. So the cladogram is including um, deuterostomes here, but then we can see our chordates is the one we're talking about now. So there's all different kinds, so excluding the deuterost the, uh, the uh, echinoderms, we can see because the echinoderms are deuterostomes, that's why they're in this particular phylogeny here. Um, but if we look at the, the chordates, the chordates include all the way from the lancelets all the way to mammals, and then everything in between. So in our little discussion in just a second, we're going to talk about tunicates and lancelets and hagfish and lamprey. We'll talk about the uh, cartilaginous fish, and then we'll talk about, we'll just kind of group these all together as bony fish. We'll talk about amphibians and the avian and non-avian uh, reptiles, and then we'll finish up with mammals. Each of these has different characteristics. For example, you know, we see here notochord, having a head, having a vertebral column, having jaws, having lungs, four limbs, and then amniotic egg, and then milk. You can do feathers. There's all different kinds of characteristics you could use to make these uh, cladograms. So we'll talk about each of those things as we go through. Um, not all chordates are vertebrates, so they don't all have uh, vertebral columns. There is, uh, is a subphylum called urochordata that uh, are invertebrate chordates. These are also called tunicates, and, uh, and uh, they contain all four chordate characteristics as larvae, but they uh, typically will lose these traits and, uh, and only have pharyngeal slits as adults. You might say, well, how do they lose these traits? Well, just like you had a post-anal tail, you lost that because it was reabsorbed. Um, these creatures will have these chordate characteristics, but then they'll be transformed into other characteristics or lost completely. Um, these organisms, once they're not larvae, are going to settle to the bottom of the water and they'll be sessile. And they are filter feeders, so they will eat materials that are microscopic and found in water. Uh, I find them to be quite beautiful organisms. If you take a look, they can come in other, every color of the rainbow. And you can see they have uh, generally two holes, an in-current siphon and an ex-current siphon. 
this is what they look like uh, anatomically. So let me divide this little thing right here. This one over here is the larval um, uh, anatomy. You can see they have a notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyn uh, pharynx with slits, and they have a postanal tail. So that's what they look like as a larval form. They do have a tail for swimming around. They can move around, but then again, again they'll, they'll eventually settle down. Once they settle down, they'll go through quite a change. Um, they'll have an in-current siphon, an ex-current siphon, so water can flow in and then water can flow out. When water flows in, it's going to flow across the pharynx with slits. And if you notice, the pharynx leads to the digestive tract, which then leads, of course, to the anus. So that's how they extract their food. Their food gets trapped. Um, and uh, remember, they just start eating, you know, little bits of microscopic stuff that's in the water. And, uh, and it'll take and, and transfer the stuff to the, to the uh, digestive tract. Okay. So that's kind of what a tunicate looks like. I'm not going to get into a lot of its anatomy. Um, I've never personally seen one of these living. I have there's specimens at uh, the college, and uh, but but never seen one living. I can't say I've ever seen one in an aquarium either. So um, subphylum uh, cephalocordata uh, are also known as lancelets. These things aren't super huge. Um, they contain all four uh, of the characteristics uh, in simple form as adults. So um, those are the four characteristics, the notochords, uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord, postanal tail, and pharyngeal slits. All of those can be seen in these organisms um, as adults. But again, these are still um, invertebrate chordates. They are suspension feeders, so they'll eat things that are suspended in the water. And when you find these, you they're found partially buried in sand with the head region exposed to the water. So this is kind of what they look like. They have little sensory tentacles. So this would be like sand or some substrate they're living in. They're underneath there, dug into a, a little hole that they formed. And uh, it's a little hole that they formed. Here's the head region up here. And, uh, and you can see they have a mouth all the way to an anus, so a complete digestive tract. And they have the notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and, uh, and uh, pharyngeal slits, and postanal tail. So they have all the characteristics of chordates, but they don't have vertebrae. Um, and uh, so they're not super complex compared to some of the chordates we're about to see. Okay, now we want to talk about craniata and vertebrata. Um, so these are chordates with a skull. Now, some of them with a skull don't necessarily have vertebrae, so we'll go through and talk about that. So the jawless fish, and one of the members of the jawless fish group is the hagfish, which is what is shown right here in this, uh, in this graphic. Um, these are chordates that have a cranium, but they do not have jaws or vertebrae. So these are jawless fish, and uh, they don't have vertebrae, but they do have the characteristics of other chordates. Um, I like the, the hagfish. I've seen these before in, um, in museum displays, um, like Ripley's Aquarium in Myrtle Beach. Um, and uh, they're, they're kind of almost eel-like or snake-like. They have a really flexible body. And you can see these little pores right here are slime pores. So they ooze out of slime all over their body. That helps to protect them from being eaten by predators. Um, I think they're very distasteful also. These are typically scavengers, so if a whale or some large fish dies and sinks to the bottom of the ocean, the hagfish is one of the scavengers that's actually going to eat its body. So another jawless fish will include the lamprey. It's kind of a cool looking animal. If you look at the, the, the little disc here, this little oral disc, you can see all of the teeth inside, but they don't have jaws. This leads, of course, to the mouth and then to the digestive tract. It has little simple eyes over here and uh, so these do not these do contain vertebrae, um, but they don't have jaws. Um, these can be major uh, problems. They can be parasites. If you see, they're stuck on this uh, this fish here, so they're attached to it, and uh, they do have that little sucker and teeth where they can actually attach to, and they will tear chunks off of fish. Now these wounds, you know, if you're a fisherman and you collect a lot of these fish, you can't sell this fish to the fish market because they have wounds there. So in some areas, these are commercially significant because they actually do major damage to fisheries because they're parasites of fish. 
Um, these have been introduced into like the Great Lakes where they never were before, and uh, they become very, very problematic um, at, uh, at parasitizing commercially um, um, caught fish. Um, so the jawed fishes uh, are going to include the cartilaginous fish, and uh, this will be the first group that we'll see. The cartilaginous fish do have a, a skeleton made of cartilage. This group includes the rays, skates, sharks, and sawfish. So there's a wide variety of them that are found there. They do have jaws. Their skeleton is made of cartilage. They have paired fins that I'll show you a picture of in a second. They have very interesting skin with placoid scales. These are scales that are made out of the same material that your teeth are made out of. And they do have a two-chambered heart. So here's some of your paired fins. Um, you know, we have the tail fin or the caudal fin. There's an anal fin. There's a first and second dorsal fin, pelvic fins, and then pectoral fins. These fins allow the fish to do all kinds of movements through the water, up and down movements, side to side movements, and then forward movements. Um, the caudal tail allows for forward propulsion. Here's some of the uh, members of this particular group. Uh, we have the, the sharks. We have the skates, we have rays, and sawfish. There's also ratfish. I didn't include a picture of that. Here's those placoid scales I was talking to you about. Um, these scales are ma actually made out of enamel. So this is the part that would be exposed to the out surface, outside surface, and then it's anchored. It does have, um, you know, uh, it is anchored in the epidermis and in the dermis. It has a pulp chamber. It has dentin, just like your teeth do. Your teeth have enamel, dentin, and a pulp cavity. Okay, so these are uh, are very similar to teeth, and they're very very tough. If you've ever touched a shark before or a ray, you know that it feels like sandpaper almost, uh, a heavy grit sandpaper. So uh, in the olden days, before we had sandpaper, they actually used uh, shark skin as sandpaper. Um, sharks have, well, sharks and rays and uh, other members of the cartilaginous fish, they have some really nice sensory organs that help them to sense various kinds of things. So uh, being able to sense things that are around you, they actually have the ability to sense water currents. Water currents will go through these little tubes and the, and the waves of water will move through and they will, um, they will move past these little neuromast uh, sensory organs and uh, when these things bend one way or another, um, they actually send information to the brain through nerves to, to, to tell the animal, um, you know, if there's water currents or things that are near them. I, I assume you've seen uh, fish swim in schools before, and uh, the reason they don't keep on running into each other is because of these, uh, these lateral line systems of uh, sensory organs. So these are called lateral line systems, and many fish have them. And uh, this is the first time that we've seen any uh, chordate have them. So um, members of this group, uh, especially sharks, also have the ampullae of Lorenzini. These are little sensory structures on the on the um, on the head. They can be on the bottom of the head or the top of the head. But these are little sensory structures that are electromagnetic uh, receptors, and uh, they actually sense. Um, uh, bioelectric fields coming off of prey. So a shark can sense things that are underneath of the sand because of these particular um, these particular sensory organs. If you ever look at a hammerhead shark, a hammerhead shark has all of these these little um, the ampullae of Lorenzini on the on the sides of its head. And when you see a hammerhead shark moving, it moves its head from side to side from side to side, and it's trying to find bioelectric fields of its prey. So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, these things also have the ability to sense chemicals in the ocean, so they can sense blood and other chemicals very easily. So these are master predators of the ocean. Um, just speaking about sharks, though, it's a real shame that we always see people um, in the news being bitten by sharks. You know, you're very unlikely to ever be bitten by a shark, but it seems like people have a great fear of them. And unfortunately, fear, you know, oftentimes will help us uh, to, um, 
will, will, will cause us to uh, want to go out and destroy these creatures. These are major players in ecosystems of the ocean. They actually keep the ocean very, very healthy. So it's important that we don't damage these creatures and over-harvest them. We will be talking about uh, shark fin soup uh, later on in the semester and uh, some of the things we're doing to over-harvest them. So um, keep that in mind as we go further in this class. So bony fish, as you can imagine, have bones. There's about 30,000 species, so there's a tremendous number of species of, these, of this particular group. Of course, their skeleton's made of bone. They have a different kind of scale. They have an overlapping scale, uh, and they produce lots of mucus. And if you've ever caught a live fish before, you know they're really slippery and slimy from the mucus that they produce. Um, they do have a unique characteristic that the other groups didn't have, which is a swim bladder. This is a little bladder that can fill with air so they can actually remain buoyant. Uh, if a shark stops swimming, it actually sinks. But if bony fish stop using their fins for swimming, they can remain buoyant in the water because of the swim bladder. That swim bladder can fill with air and they can rise and they can deflate with air and they can sink. Um, they do use gills to breathe, although some uh, bony fish do have lungs that they can use to breathe as well. And they too have a two-chambered heart. This is just showing you a sampling of uh, the bony fish scales. There's tetanoid scales and cycloid scales and granoid scales, or organoid scales, excuse me. The placoid scales would be what you would find in the cartilaginous fish. The scales are different. They're not made of um, enamel and dentin. But they do have a bony, uh, a bony plate underneath of the epidermis or the skin, and they're anchored into the dermis or the lower skin layers. And they do have lots of mucus glands to make them slippery and slimy, so they can escape predators and they can slip through the water. They come in many, many, many different forms, these 30,000 different kinds. Some of them are flattened. Some of them are eel-like. Okay, that would be the moray eel, and this over here would be the flounder. Um, they come in a more fish-like form, like grouper. Um, and uh, some of them are very strange, like the angler fish. They have little bioluminescent organs, and they live where there's no light under the ocean. And they hunt by using their bioluminescent organ to attract prey, almost like a lure. Some of them are really strange-looking. Okay, so these are trigger fish. Probably one of my favorite fish is the Hawaiian trigger fish. And uh, this is massive camouflage that you're seeing. One of the little characteristics there is they have a black line hiding their eyes so that uh, another fish predator won't know where their head is. And uh, these I just like. I like the stonefish, the lionfish, and the scorpion fish because these are venomous fish. You definitely don't want to get in contact with this end of the fish right here. Now, just regular bony fish, those things will, you know, if you ever caught a fish before, the little spines coming from the dorsal uh, fin um, will actually cause, uh, you know, will puncture your skin. But in the lionfish and the scorpion fish and the stonefish, these uh, dorsal fins are modified into being venomous, um, venomous uh, structures. Um, they're attached to venom glands. Um, they do try to warn you, so, um, so naturally they, they just blend into their environment, but uh, they do have the ability uh, to warn you. So these are warning colors or flash startle colors here to say, hey, don't step on me. If you do, you're going to get envenomated. But if you don't heed the warning and you, and, you, um, and you walk or touch one of these things, they do have a venom apparatus to, to uh, make you want to stop um, uh, touching them. Let me see if I can get my black color. Here we go. So, um, so how do these venomous uh, spines work? Well, here's the spines, and this is a magnified view of it here. So it, uh, it does have an opening. It is found underneath the skin. But the, the little spine has an opening, um, but it again is under the skin. There's a sheath that covers over the whole spine, and there's a venom duct leading down to a venom gland, okay, and it's held together by connective tissue. Well, if you put pressure on that sheath, the spine will puncture through, and uh, venom will be injected into the, the, uh, the organism that's, um, that's touching it. Now, this is a defensive venom. It's not, a, um, it's not a, an offensive venom where they're using the venom to catch prey. So this defensive venom is going to cause extreme pain um, so that you'll stop touching the animal. Uh, many times it's fatal in humans. The pain is so great 
that humans uh, actually die from the from the pain. A lot of times people drown uh, in the water. Uh, what can you do if you're envenomated? Well, get out of the water so you don't drown. But um, heating the uh, your tissues with hot water will deactivate the venom, and some people use vinegar as well to deactivate the venom. But seek medical help for sure. Um, these are common animals. If you ever go to Florida, the lionfish has been introduced, and it's everywhere in Florida now in the coral reefs. Um, these fish are also found in Hawaii, and they're found in other tropical areas of the world. Okay, so amphibians is our next group of chordates. These include some really strange ones like the uh, Sicilians, which uh, I've never even seen them in zoos before. They're tropical, but I've seen lots of frogs and salamanders. That's my area of, uh, of expertise. Um, they do have four limbs. Some of them have lost limbs, though. I'll show you some of the legless ones in uh, a minute. Um, they uh, have no scales, and uh, they are smooth, moist. Uh, they have smooth, moist, or relatively permeable skin. Their skin is glandular. It has all kinds of uh, uh, poisons uh, that ooze over the surface of it to kill bacteria and fungi. And then some of them have uh, poison glands that uh, that are defensive weapons. Um, they are ectothermic, which means they uh, they get their heat from the environment. Uh, maybe you've driven at night after a rain and you've seen many amphibians on the road, like frogs on the road, that were um, utilizing the heat from the road. Um, they do have eyelids and lacrimal glands or tear glands to lubricate the eyelids. Their eggs are jelly-like with uh, a membrane covering. So this makes them very sensitive. They have to lay their eggs where it's moist. Sometimes they lay their eggs in ponds or streams or under rocks or under logs. Anywhere where it's moist, um, they can lay their eggs. There's lots of other ways they can lay eggs too. Some of them, like the marsupial frog, will lay eggs in the back of their skin and their skin grows over the eggs. They do have a three-chambered heart, so there's a little bit more advanced heart. And uh, all the adults are uh, carnivorous. This is a Sicilian, and uh, this is a, um, a tropical uh, amphibian. You notice it doesn't have four legs, so, uh, but it, does, it has lost those legs over evolutionary time. And the Sicilians are, um, are um, uh, there's very little known about them because they're, they're rare and uh, they're tropical. Very few people have studied them before. Now, the frogs are, are very common in our area. We have about 28 species in our area. And uh, this one happens to be a spadefoot toad. It's one of my areas of interest. This is a southern leopard frog. This frog, these frogs over here are green frog and bullfrog, and then we have the American toad. There's a lot of different varieties of frogs. Uh, some are tree frogs. Some are more uh, terrestrial, like your toads are more terrestrial. Some uh, live in deserts and uh, and live underground for most of their life, like the spadefoots are known for living in deserts, and other the other others of them live in ponds. Um, frogs are really important because they, uh, they can tell you about uh, water and land pollution. So where you have water pollution, they can't grow their tadpoles. Where you have land pollution, they can't live as adults. So these are what we would call indicator species. They indicate the health of the environment. Another indicator species would be the salamanders. These salamanders are, are beautiful. Uh, Virginia has many different species of salamanders, and, uh, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Every one of these salamanders in this, in this little uh, montage of pictures here is, uh, is uh, found in Virginia. This is one of my favorites. These are found in southwest Virginia. These are called the green salamanders. We then have the cave salamander, the Yanalasi salamander, tiger salamander. Uh, I just finished catching some of these just a few weeks ago. These are called Amphiuma, and if you notice, they have vestigial legs. So the legs have reduced down in size to a um, to almost like a humerus and a ulna radius, and then they have two toes. So these are called a two-toed Amphiuma. We have aquatic salamanders like the mud puppy, and then we have also the hellbender. So lots of different variety of salamanders in Virginia. It's a hot spot in the world. There are salamanders in Virginia you can't find anywhere else in the world. And uh, so uh, these amphibians uh, used to be really super big, and some there are still some existing ones that are big. 
This is the Goliath frog over here, and this is a, a river frog found in uh, equatorial Africa. And unfortunately, they har are harvested for food, and their numbers are diminishing as people eat them for food. If you go to, to, uh, to Japan, um, you can actually find the giant salamander. This is a giant salamander here. We have the hellbender, which is pretty big, but we don't have ones that are five uh, feet long, like you see that uh, guy holding there. Okay, well now, now I'll go ahead and, go ahead and discuss the uh, reptiles. Um, we have non-avian reptiles, which include the snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodilians. These are uh, ectothermic. Their body is covered in scales. They have internal fertilization, so the sperm is to, taken in, um, to, in by the female, so we have internal fertilization. Uh, we have a new structure that we haven't talked about yet called the amniotic egg. Uh, if you remember fish and amphibians, they have a gel-like egg that has to be deposited in moist areas or in water. The amniotic egg allows for the reptiles um, and other creatures that have am amniotic eggs to uh, to become more terrestrial. You know, animals did evolve in water from fish, and then they evolved um, to live on land later on. And uh, the amniotic egg was one of the things that had to develop in order for this evolution uh, onto land uh, before that could have occurred. Um, these reptiles do have a more advanced kidney called a metanephric kidney. They do have lungs. And they have a three-chambered heart, at least snakes, lizards, and turtles do. Uh, uh, you know, the crocodilians uh, have a four-chambered heart, uh, much like you. Here's the amniotic egg. I just wanted to go over the, these different membranes inside of the egg with you because this is a really important uh, structure. Now, I know you don't have a shell around you when you formed, but we do actually have these uh, particular structures, these, uh, these various uh, membranes. So, um, so albumin is going to provide the embryo with water and with protein. So if you look at this, this is a shelled egg, and there is an albumin, which is the substance out here. It's a protein that will uh, supply the uh, animal with uh, water and with protein to grow its body. Uh, they do have yolk. So you can see the yolk is right here. Uh, you actually have a yolk sac, and they have a yolk sac too. Um, so your yolk sac doesn't provide you with a lot of nutrients. It actually becomes blood cells and, and forms blood cells early on in your embryonic development. Um, so, but uh, this yolk supplies the embryo with energy. And if you ever eat a chicken egg before, you, the yellow part is the yolk. The amnion is a membrane that protects the embryo from impacts. So if we look at the amnion, it actually covers, it's a membrane that covers the embryo. And it provides a shock absorbing um, protection uh, and it hydrates or uh, you know gives water to the embryo. Um, if you've ever heard of a water, uh, the, the female's water breaking right before she gives birth, that's amniotic fluid that's flowing out through the vaginal canal. So that was when the amnion actually breaks, the membrane breaks. The chorion is a membrane that uh, covers over, you see right here, it's a membrane that covers over all of those structures and uh, it, uh, it provides for gas exchange um, so that oxygen can come in and carbon dioxide can go out of the, um, of the animal. So that shell has to be permeable to gases and to water. The allantois is, uh, is, a, is a membrane that will store uh, nitrogenous waste products. So the animal does make wastes and it has to have a place to store it. And the allantois is the place where it's stored. So this is what an amniotic egg is. So you can have a shell that allows for the protection against the drying out, and uh, that allows the animals to become more terrestrial. This just shows you a little bit of the evolution of the kidney. The kidney started out as a pronephros, so we, we, we essentially have a, a little tube that can collect nitrogenous wastes and excrete those out. These tubes become more numerous and, uh, and, uh, and more complex, as they become me meta mesonephrous kidneys, and you see these in your fish and your amphibians, uh, some amphibians. And then um, as you got to the metanephrous, the metanephric kidney, they become actual structures instead of just a series of tubes. Um, inside of these structures, there are lots and lots of tubes, um, and, uh, and uh, this is found in, in your more terrestrial, more complex organisms. 
A problem with becoming terrestrial is that you don't want to lose too much water. Since these creatures, a lot of these creatures are living in water, they, you know, they don't have to have super sophisticated kidneys because they can always bring in as much water as they're getting out. But when you start becoming terrestrial, you have to really worry about losing water through your kidneys uh, and not excreting too much water. So we have to have really efficient kidneys and the metanephric kidney evolved to give us that particular characteristic. So these are some of the, uh, the non-avian reptiles. We have lizards here. These are just lizards we find in Virginia. Six-line race runner, five, common five-line skink. We do have legless lizards. This is the eastern slender glass lizard. And uh, this is found in Virginia, and it's uh, basically lost its limbs through evolution to become more um, almost snake-like. And, uh, and then this is just the uh, fence lizard. So we have many different species, and uh, they're really cool. Um, these are just some examples of snakes. Uh, we have a wide variety of snakes in Virginia, different colors, all the way from green to tan. And uh, some are, uh, you know, uh, aquatic. Uh, they live in water, not exclusively, but they live mainly near water. Some are more, uh, you know, terrestrial, live on tops of mountains. So um, these happen to be venomous ones. This is the, co uh, the copperhead, a uh, very common uh, venomous snake. Um, this is the cottonmouth water moccasin, and then this is the timber rattlesnake. Each of these has uh, offensive venom. When they inject venom into humans, it's not offensive, but it's defensive. The venom is, uh, is a um, hemorrhagic venom, so it causes the lysis or destruction of red blood cells. When you have enough red blood cells that get destroyed in your body, it releases huge amounts of calcium, and that calcium will cause hyperkalemia and will cause your uh, heart to stop working or your muscles to stop working uh, correctly. So um, these venoms are also full of digestive enzymes, and they help to digest their prey um, and to kill their prey quickly. Uh, we could talk a lot about these. They're cool. You know, they have fangs. They have, you know, the, I can't show you too closely, but they do have these little heat sensing pits. So these are called pit vipers, but they can sense heat coming off their prey at night. So really cool creatures. I wish I wish we had more time to talk about them. So another non-avian uh, um, group would be your turtles. So uh, this happens to be the, uh, the eastern woodland box turtle. This is just a sea turtle here, snapping turtle, and this is a uh, musk turtle. So all of these are found in Virginia. We have a wide variety of turtles in Virginia. And uh, you notice that they, they do have a shell on the outside. So that's one of the major characteristics of this group. And then, of course, there's crocodilians. That would include your caimans, your crocodiles, and your alligators. So um, we have crocodiles and alligators in um, in uh, uh, North America. We also have uh, caimans that are probably introduced. Um, you know, people have them as pets and then release them into um, the habitat. Now, another group of reptiles are the avian reptiles. So, yes, birds are now uh, considered to be reptiles. So, they have a lot of characteristics that are in common with reptiles. They do have some unique characteristics, though. They have a long S-shaped neck. They have four limbs that are modified as uh, wings. Of course, they have scales on their legs, but they have uh, feathers that cover the rest of their body. They don't have teeth. They do have a beak, though. They do have a, a gizzard, which is a, a digestive organ that helps them to grind food up. Uh, you may have seen birds eating uh, rocks on the sides of the road or just sitting on the sides of the road. What they're doing is eating rocks, which they use to put in their gizzard, and those rocks help them to grind food up. They do have internal fertilization, so the female does bring sperm inside and fertilize the eggs inside of her body. They do have an amniotic egg with a calcareous shell. The calcareous shell is a calcium-based shell. And it's a little bit harder than the more flexible shells of lizards and snakes and turtles. They do have a four-chambered heart that they use to pump blood through their body. And they are endothermic, so they are warm-blooded. They come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes, so they can be really super small like the hummingbird, or they can be super large like an ostrich. And then there's intermediate ones. This is the prothonotary warbler here that we have in Virginia. They come in duck forms and woodpecker forms, and of course penguins are birds as well. 
Uh, some of them can fly and some of them can not fly. Some of them can swim really well um, when you talk about things like penguins. So mammals uh, are going to have these particular characteristics. They have hair. They, have, they are endothermic, which means they have their own body temperature that they create. They have oil glands called sebaceous glands. They have mammary glands, which produce milk. Um, mammals have a unique characteristic being diphodont, which means they have two sets of teeth. You have a, a, a baby set of teeth called deciduous teeth that shed, and then you have your permanent adult set of teeth. We have a four-chambered heart, a metanephric or more advanced kidney, highly developed brain, and internal fertilization. So the three groups of mammals include the monotremes. The monotremes would be your um, egg-laying mammals. So yeah, there are mammals that uh, still lay eggs. Um, the duck-billed platypus and the echidna are two examples of those. So um, this one happens to be the duck-billed platypus here. It's, uh, it's, it's a really cool-looking creature. It has a duck bill. <laughs> it has uh, really uh, webbed feet, but it has fur, and it lays eggs. So um, the males, I just, I like venomous animals, but the males have these little spines. So if you look at the hind leg, they have these little spurs, which lead to venom glands. And they use these for battling other males for, um, for mating purposes and for territory. Um, these are, um, are defensive venom. This is defensive venom. So it causes extreme pain and suffering for the uh, unlucky person that gets envenomated by it or unlucky pl platypus. This is the echidna, which is another egg-laying mammal. Now these mammals are isolated into areas uh, such as uh, Australia, uh, well, Tasmania for the duckbill platypus. So our next group of mammals includes the marsupials. The marsupials are going to be um, Animals that have mammals that have a placenta. This is a structure that the embryo connects to, mo to the mother through, um, but it's not very super complex. Um, most of the time, the, the offspring are born very, very, very young, and they crawl out of the vaginal canal and they will move to uh, a pouch where they find a um, a mammary gland that they can suckle from and develop further through. So all of these particular creatures here are. Uh, our marsupials, we have the wombat, the kangaroo, the koala bear, and the sugar glider. And uh, you probably know that these all come from a common area called Australia. In Virginia, we do have uh, a member of the marsupial group. It's called the opossum. The opossum uh, originally came from South America, and when uh, a land bridge uh, formed between South America and North America and made um, made uh, Central America, the, um, the opossum actually came up from uh, South America and, uh, and migrated into North America. And uh, so it's our one uh, member of the group that's found in Virginia. So, um, so it's kind of a cool uh, organism. And then finally we have the eutherian or placental mammals. The placental mammals have a very complex placenta and uh, which connects the fetus to the mother and uh, helps the fetus to survive until it can be born. And uh, they come in many shapes and forms, these, uh, these placental mammals. We have you know, the, all the cats, uh, the mammalian cats. We have the, the horse-like uh, you know, uh, mammals, the zebra. We have the, all different kinds of whales or aquatic uh, mammals. And uh, of course, we have the manatee as well. So lots of different ones. And uh, uh, our group is uh, part of this as well. So we're in the primate group. So here we have a, a selection of primates. We have the gibbon, the orangutan, the gorilla, and then the chimpanzee. But uh, you're within this grouping as well because you share all the si same common characteristics that these animals have in common. Okay, well that completes our, our little uh, lecture on the uh, deuterostomes. And uh, remember, you're never alone. Email me. Go to the discussion board. Post questions. Um, make sure you study for study guides. Make sure you keep up with your due dates and do a nice job on uh, keeping up with your work. So uh, I'll see you next time. And uh, next time we'll be talking about uh, some of the different systems that these uh, organisms have.